Yes, I'm off vacation, and I got a lot of stuff on my mind. I got big-time college basketball to talk about, and guess what? It ain't just about the fellas. It's about the ladies. I got NBA action to talk about, including Mr. LeBron James. Excuse me, there's another last dance going on. Is it in L.A.? You're about to hear about that from me. And, of course, P. Diddy. Lord have mercy. This brother is in a load of trouble. World of trouble. All that and more coming up, but not before I take a moment to thank y'all. I've eclipsed 600,000 followers for the Stephen A. Smith Show. 602 to be exact at this moment in time. Can't thank y'all enough for the love and the support. Appreciate you as always. But again, I got some stuff on my mind. Let me get to it, please. Let's get started with the women's elite eight in college basketball taking center stage tonight with the rematch. Everybody wanted number one seed Iowa versus number three LSU, the reigning defending champions LSU. Both teams met last year drawing record breaking TV audiences over 12 million to be exact. LSU defeated Iowa to secure their program's first national championship. However, according to both coaches, it's a replay that should be happening in the final four. Regardless, this game is all about the stars, Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark. I can't wait for this. I know that South Carolina is the monster. They're back-to-back -back undefeated seasons. I get all of that. But when you talk about a rematch of last year's national title game, when you see Caitlin Clark shoot 9 of 22 from the field, 8 of 19 from three-point range, even though she finished with 30 points, 8 assists, the bottom line is going up against LSU. They drubbed them. They beat them by 17 points. Angel Reese had a field day, was torn her near the end of the game and what have you. We saw all of that and we we imagine a rematch of this magnitude with all the hype that has come associated with Caitlin Clark, combined with the chip on the shoulders that LSU collectively has from their players to their coach, Kim Mulkey herself. The bottom line is this is a matchup that you want to see, and I'm going to say it right here for the American people. This is bigger as far as I'm concerned. This is more popular as far as I'm concerned. This is more attractive as far as I'm concerned than the men's college basketball even during this time of the year the ladies have arrived make no mistake about it i got to give props to where it's due and i can't wait to see this matchup tonight that's just one item now let me get to talking about the other elite eight game which features Paige beckers of UConn playing against USC's freshman sensation Juju Watkins. Both Elite Eight games represent a golden age for women's college basketball, which I was just alluding to. It's Caitlin Clark on one hand, it's Angel Reese on another, okay? It's Juju Watkins. The girl is special. She's a freshman, averaging 27 and 7 in her first NCAA postseason tournament. She is absolutely spectacular. She's going to be the face of women's college basketball for the foreseeable future. And Lord help you, if she ends up winning this game over UConn and she gets to the final four and it's her against an LSU. It's her against a Caitlin Clark. It's her against South Carolina. This is what it's all about. The women, in my opinion, have figured out how to be even more marketable. We know they've got the skill set, but now they've really, really gravitated towards being more marketable than ever before, and I think that has elevated the attractiveness of the game even more so. So the fellas in college basketball, you better look out. The ladies are here. Let me get to my guest right now because this is the perfect person to talk about. Played at Tennessee, is an outstanding college basketball analyst for ESPN, does, doing a phenomenal job. The one and only Andrea Carter is here with me right now. How are you? How are you doing? Stephen A., I'm great. I'm, one, happy to be on the Stephen A. Smith show. That's just a blessing in itself. And Thank two, you. the way these games have shaked out, the superstars you just talked about, for me to have the opportunity to talk about their game, to watch them play, to break down what makes them great and where they can be even better. I love this so much and to have to be able to do it on this stage with these athletes it's a blessing i'm blessed that's the only thing you're, i can say you're a former player at the university of tennessee obviously you're an outstanding college basketball analyst you're just doing a sensational job i'm so proud to call you a colleague with us both working in our day jobs at espn i gotta ask you in all your years of being associated with this game have you ever seen it like this from a popularity standpoint where we're looking at an elite eight with a caitlin clark against lsu where we're looking at south carolina 
Carolina waiting. They're the monsters right now that everybody's got to worry about getting knocked off by them. Of course, Juju Watkins, I just brought up UConn. Their 28th Elite Eight appearance, for crying out loud, led by Gino Oriana, uh, Oriema. Has the game ever been this popular in your estimation? No, Stephen A. It hasn't been. And trust me, I followed college basketball as a kid. Like, I grew up on women's college basketball. The games that you could watch, I was tuned into those games. I had my favorite players. I had my favorite teams. But right now, it's a combination, one, of the superstars that are on these teams, and then, two, the visibility that they have. Not just the visibility of this tournament, but the visibility of these players on their journeys throughout their career. We've gotten to see Caitlin Clark grow and blossom. We've seen her more and more every season. We've seen Angel Reese dominate and her energy and her smile and the way she talks trash and the chip on her shoulder. We've gotten to see these players throughout their career. So it has just created this huge buzz. Juju Watkins comes on the scene and what happens? Everybody knows who she is because the visibility, it's the perfect combination of visibility, opportunity, and talent. Like, this is the best combination where all three of those things have been maximized. That's why it's so big. It's the players, but it's also this moment in time where we all get to see it. Like, if you don't know, you'll soon know, and you'll catch on quickly. People are talking about it. People are bringing it up. People are putting it on social media. It's everywhere. But it's not just everywhere for no reason. It's everywhere because the players are that good. It's just... This is the biggest it's been, and it's not close. What is the number one attraction? And I know the easy answer is Caitlin Clark, but I also think a rematch, an impending rematch in some people's eyes between LSU and South Carolina, based on how lethal both of these teams are, based on the near fisticuffs they nearly came two weeks ago when they went up against one another. I think that is incredibly attractive to the sport. But other people would say it starts and stops with Caitlin Clark. Where do you stand? Yeah. Yeah, see, that's the thing, Stephen, and I know people are going to say that. In Iowa, and Caitlin, it's obviously a huge story. But anybody trying to take down this South Carolina team is going to be a big story. One, if they happen to do it, it would be bigger than anything. Two, South Carolina dominating in general is a story to watch. Can that team stay undefeated? That is a story in itself, no matter who is on the opposite side. What Coach Staley has been able to do, with new starters after losing the winningest class in program history. The winningest class in program history. It'd be like trying to put on your show, Stephen A., and you lost you, the producer, the camera person, the audio person, and the ops. You lost all five. Let's do it again. Right? That's what Don Staley has been able to do this year with this team. But I'm telling you, Juju going up potentially for a national championship is a story in itself because she's a freshman. Not many freshmen lead their team to the Final Four or to a national championship game. Even Paige Beckers at UConn, that's a story. She played 17 games two years ago. She missed last season. What she's been able to do, if they get back to a Final Four, that's a big deal. Paige, you heard Don Staley say she's the most elite player in the country. She says that because of Paige's efficiency. Paige doesn't take bad shots. Paige makes great decisions. And then even on the other side, I don't even throw NC State in there. Nobody had NC State in mind this is a team that had an up and down year left and right their women's team and their men's team have a why not us mentality but the story is top to bottom for all four teams on the women's side that could potentially meet in the final four i know caitlin and lsu is huge but if it doesn't happen to be iowa and lsu whoever comes out of that is just going to be as big i'm telling you andre let me put that, you, andre let me put you on the spot if Paige Beckers. Yeah. doesn't have that nasty knee injury that forced her to miss all of last season. If she's never had any injury issues, her or Caitlin Clark, who's that person? I'm putting you on the spot, Andrea. You want to see what they I'm putting you on the spot right now. I want to hear the answer to that question. This, uh, this is so tough. This is like, this is honestly, it's like deciding between, I don't know, pick your, pick your two favorite players. It's like between Asia Wilson and Brianna Stewart. It's like, do you, which point guard do you like? Which, which post player do you like? Picking between these two is so hard. For me personally, I would take a fully healthy Paige Beckers. Wow. There is no doubt. Like, it's her decision making. It's her efficiency. It's her composure. It's her leadership. It's her skill set. Like, Paige, the thing about Paige, Paige can defend one through four. 
People underestimate Paige's ability to be a one-on-one -on -one defender for positions one through four. She's doing it coming off of her knee injuries. Paige, at times, has had to play back to the basket. This UConn roster wow. is depleted. They are completely depleted. When you watch the game tonight, do me a favor. Look at Connecticut's bench. Look at the young women in sweatsuits. You will see just the stature that they sit with on the bench. They're long, they're big, they're athletic, they're potential pros, they're starters, all just sitting there. And what Paige has been able to do in her composure while she's done it, a healthy Paige Beckers is so hard for me. Like, just, just go back and watch her highlights from her freshman year. She won National Player of the Year as a freshman for a reason. Yeah. She was, injuries are the most brutal part of sports. I don't care what anybody says. They're the most brutal part. Caitlin and Paige are both amazing. If I had to pick one like you just made me do, I would go with Paige. We were talking about Caitlin Clark during my day job earlier this morning on First Take, and one of the debates that we were having was, can anything affect the legacy of Caitlin Clark? My, your position was, you got to win the championship. When you mention all the time greats, the Cheryl Mills, the Diana Taurasi's, the Breonna Stewart's of the world, Maya Moore's, everybody else, they won championships. You got to win at least one. My attitude was, hey, I don't think she has to win one. She just can't mess it up. She can't show up and have a bad performance. If she performs like we're accustomed to seeing Caitlin Clark perform, but you just lose to a superior LSU team, there is no crime in that. As you've had an opportunity to reflect on that perspective, do you still feel the same way? I still feel the same way, Stephen A. Like two, two parts on your take from earlier this morning. One, I think... Caitlin, something would have to be egregious for Caitlin. Even if she goes against LSU and isn't as efficient as we're used to her seeing, I don't think that affects her legacy. I think something egregious would have to happen. If there's one thing I know about Caitlin Clark, she's not going out sad. So I don't think her performance is going to have anything on her legacy because I, every moment that she has had to meet this season, she hasn't just met it. She's blasted through it. Okay. So I have no doubt she's going to perform. However, with her legacy... She has to win a championship, in my opinion, to be in the GOAT conversation. If she wins one, her resume is goaded. It's goaded. Like, it's not even close. And I still stand on great programs win multiple. But a great player, and that is Caitlin Clark, on a good team. Her team's not great. Her team is good. And I've had Iowa fans come at me crazy for saying I'm dragging Caitlin's teammates. Let me just make it clear. Me comparing a teammate to Renee Montgomery or Tina Charles or Cynthia Cooper or Tamika Catchings, that is not dragging those players. Absolutely those not. Those players are good. I'm not saying they're right. not good. I'm saying they're not lottery WNBA draft picks. So let's just get that out of the way. I'm not saying her team is bad, but her team is good. She is capable of leading them to a championship. And since that is in the realm of possibility, especially with South Carolina playing teams closely recently, it's not out of this world that they could do it. So because it's possible, that is the standard for her to be considered a GOAT. Mm -hmm. So if she loses today, that opportunity is missed. She's still the okay. greatest scorer of all time, one of the greatest of all time. She can't be considered the GOAT without a chip. Quick answers to this question. We got UConn, USC, who you got? I have USC. Because? I think they have more depth. They've got more depth on their post play. They've got a little bit more overall togetherness on the offensive end and as far as their speed up and down the court like UConn's been great but they rely heavily on two freshmen KK Arnold and Ashlyn Shade Ashlyn Shade has played great KK Arnold has played great USC I know Juju's a freshman but they have grad transfers that have been there they have grad transfers with Juju for me the defense that they can play like UConn cannot afford to get in foul trouble whatsoever mm. And I, I just think USC, they have more pieces. Like Paige and Juju are amazing. I think USC can get up and down mm -hmm. a little bit more. I had them winning earlier right. in, the in the bracket when I saw it. Right. So watching them, I still think it's USC. Our rematch of the national championship game, LSU, Iowa. Who you got real quickly and why? I have the LSU Tigers because their size and Angel Reese and Anissa Morrow and their speed with Flage Johnson pushing tempo and getting out in transition and her length defensively, those three things combined with them coming in with the chip on their shoulder that they just did it last year, Haley Van Lith having something to prove. I just think they have more talented pieces 
that they can utilize. If one player is struggling, they can lean on somebody else. Last question. Kim Mulkey, coach at LSU, has been embroiled in some headlines, to say the least. One where she's complaining about a Washington Post reporter and a quote-unquote hit job that they were going to do on her turned out to be much ado about nothing because it's, up, it's, it's more of what we already knew about her. Uh, but then the L.A. Times obviously calling her players dirty deputantes before they ultimately had to retract that, omit that, send out a different edited edition, um, and, and basically acknowledge it didn't meet their editorial standards. Your thought about Kim Mulkey, what she's made news for, um, and how it's been received. You know, Kim Kim is obviously very polarizing, but I think the one thing that I've been impressed with with her team is they somehow seem to thrive in chaos. Like, the one thing that you can't argue with is that her team has pulled together every time that they've needed to. There are things I don't agree with. On both sides, I don't agree with the article whatsoever. The article was disrespectful. I don't know how you say something doesn't meet editorial standards Deputy that's Tosh, already yeah. been put out into the world. That doesn't make any sense. If it didn't meet right. standards, it shouldn't have been put out into the world. Right. Uh, she you know, stood by her players and defended them in that moment and for that article, and I respect that. And there have been other things that I haven't agreed with all the time that Kim Mulkey has done. But the one thing I'm concerned with are her players performing and do they pull together when they need to? And with all the distractions that they've had going on, be it from an article, be it from their coach's behavior, the players have found a way to pull together. And this will be the biggest test of whether or not they can do that again. Yeah, I don't blame her one bit for calling out the L.A. Times and the de dirty deputants was completely Ridiculous. uncalled for, no doubt about it. One other thing I want to say about Kim Mulkey, 24 seasons as a head coach, three-time coach of the year, four-time national champion, and has never, ever, ever had a season in 24 years where she has won less than 20 games. That is absolutely phenomenal. So are you, Andrea Carter. Appreciate you coming on the show for the first time. Thank you so much. And you know I'm going to be glued to my TV tonight. I know you are, too. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Stephen. I appreciate you. Now, let me take a second to make sure everyone knows it is that time of year again. The Final Four is here, and Prize Picks has got you covered. That's right. With the big games upon us, Prize Picks is going to help you cash in. You see, Prize Picks is a daily fantasy app where you can select two or more of your favorite players and then pick more or less on their projected in game stats. Best part is, Prize Picks has something for every sports fan. Choose from the NBA to MLB, League of Legends, and everything in between. You can pick K. Caitlin Clark, Juan Soto, and Sidney Crosby, all in the same entry. I make my picks and submit early, all in less than 60 seconds. Then I sit back and I just watch. And get this, prize picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. You heard me right. Go to prizepicks.com and use code SAS, that's my initials of course, for a first deposit match of up to $100. That's SAS when you go to prizepicks.com and then use the promo code. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. LeBron James continues to make NBA headlines with his scoring. He scored 40 points in L.A.'s 116-104 win over the Brooklyn Nets on Sunday, joining Michael Jordan as the only players in NBA history with multiple games of over 40 points, or 40 points or more, after turning 39. James now has done it twice. Jordan, who played until he was 40, did it three times. And after Sunday's 116-104 win, he acknowledged that the end is nearer than it's ever been. Not very long, says LeBron. I'm not going to play another 21 years, that's for damn sure. I don't know when that door will close, but I don't have much time left. Look, we've heard this from LeBron James before. It's nothing new. He's entering his 20th season, his 22nd season, I'm sorry. He's age, entering age 40, he's 39 years of age. We understand this. We get all of this. That's not the issue for me when it comes to LeBron James. The issue for me when it comes to LeBron James is, is this the last dance for the Los Angeles Lakers? That's what I'm questioning. Is this the last dance? If LeBron is looking this way, do you expect him to look better next year? I don't. Anthony Davis is going to play 65 to 70 games this year. Do you expect that to repeat itself next year? I don't. Do you expect the Lakers to be better than Denver next year? Better than Oklahoma City, better than Minnesota, better than Dallas, better than Phoenix. Do you expect this better than Sacramento? Do you expect this? I don't. As I'm scouring through the Western Conference and I see these teams on a come up and I see the Lakers who've won six of their last seven, 
who's got one of the best records in the NBA at 18 and 8 since like damn near February. When I look at this Los Angeles Lakers team, knowing that level of success they've been able to enjoy, but still they're the ninth seed in the Western Conference, that tells you everything you need to know. Folks are not going away. They ain't going to sit up there and, and, and move aside to the Los Angeles Lakers. As far as I'm concerned, this is the last dance for LeBron James and the Los Angeles Lakers. You can't get it done now. I don't believe you're going to get it done next year. We can talk about another a third superstar that's going to come to Los Angeles. Really? That's what we're doing now? How's that worked out for everybody? How's that working out in Phoenix? KD, Bradley Beal, Devin Booker. How's that working out? Huh? It remains to be seen. James Harden, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard. Huh? I don't know. I don't know. To me, this is the last dance for LeBron James, unless he's planning on going someplace else to play. As long as he's staying in Los Angeles, I think this is it right here. He's got to go for it. Now. Because tomorrow, damn sure ain't guaranteed. Coming up next, the legal issues involving the one and only Sean P. Diddy Combs. Stay tuned. We've got a lot to talk about. We've got a legal analyst in the house, the one and only Ariva Martin. Stay tuned. You're listening. You're watching The Stephen A. Smith Show. Back with more in a minute. Spring is here, y'all, and I don't know about you, but I need to be outside, either sitting in the sun at a baseball game or watching my favorite performer at an outdoor concert. And when I need to find a hot deal on those tickets, the best place i found to do it is right here on SeatGeek app. SeatGeek gives you access to over 70,000 events, including concerts, games, festivals, and more, and provides access and convenience on tickets to almost any event. They put all the tickets across the web in one place to make sure you're getting the best deal. And that's why I'm excited to have a ticketing partner like SeatGeek, who helps the Stephen A. Smith Show listeners navigate today's ticketing market to guarantee you can see whoever it is you want whether it's a big-time artist like Drake or Jelly Roll or when the New York Yankees are back in town. And I'm coming through with a special offer. Use my code SAS10, as in the number 10, for 10% off tickets at SeatGeek. That's right. Go now and download the SeatGeek app and use my code SAS10 for 10% off to take advantage of this limited-time offer. Make sure you click the link in the description to download the app. Pretty please. Moving on to the legal case involving Sean P. Diddy Combs, the Bad Boy Entertainment CEO has been hit with five, count them, five lawsuits since November of 2023, accusing him of sexual assault, sexual trafficking, and engaging in criminal activity. Last week, federal agents raided his homes in Los Angeles and Miami. Combs was not at either location, but his sons, Justin and Christian, were detained and handcuffed during the raid of his home in Los Angeles. Uh, no one better to talk to about this matter than my next guest. She is uh, obviously a legal expert for CNN. She's a best-selling author. She's a civil rights attorney, a commentator, obviously, for CNN. Like I said, the one and only Ariva Martin. How are you? Fantastic. <sighs> the word fantastic certainly can be applied to Sean P. Diddy Combs right now. So many people have looked out, looked at the situation, and they said... This looks bad, but somehow, some way, it, it might be all pomp and circumstance, just a man, a man in which to embarrass him. Obviously, you know in the law the way that you do. How serious are these allegations and how much trouble is Sean P. Diddy Combs in? Well, the Homeland Security is not raiding your home to embarrass you, so let's just uh, disabuse ourselves of, of that notion. Now, whether he actually gets charged, we don't know, because so far there are no criminal charges that have been filed against him. But clearly, there was enough evidence mm -hmm. to present to a magistrate judge to get search warrants to go into his home uh, and to confiscate, you know, matters from his home. We were told or media reports that there were electronic devices and other things taken away from his home and that he was even stopped in an airport in yeah. Miami and things were, you know, phones, I imagine, were confiscated from him. So 
all very serious, nothing that anyone would want to happen to them. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, his lawyer is denying any wrongdoing. He's categorically denied all of the charges that have been uh, lodged against him in those civil complaints. But I think it's too soon for anyone to know what's going to happen uh, in this case from a criminal standpoint. We already know civilly he's paid some settlement amount to mm -hmm. uh, Cassandra Ventura, Cassie, and there are ex other yes. ex-girlfriend, other civil lawsuits that are pending, seeking millions of dollars in compensation. So, uh, and he's lost a lot mm -hmm. of his business opportunities, and people have walked away from him, as people tend to do mm -hmm. when those kind of allegations are made against you. What are we to make of the fact that it was Homeland Security, Miami, Los Angeles, respectively, as opposed to just the LAPD or the local police department? What are we to make of the fact that Homeland Security is the ones, the other ones who raided both homes? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Homeland Security has a specific unit that focuses on sex trafficking. And if you look at those civil complaints that have been filed, that term, those allegations of sex trafficking come up. Uh, numerous times throughout those civil lawsuits. So I think what we are to make of it, uh, to the extent we can read anything into the raids, is that they have something to do, or likely have something to do, with sex trafficking. What do you make of the fact that they are put his children in handcuffs and escorted them out of his home, yet when they found him in Miami, he was en route to the Bahamas, they just questioned him, took his cell phone or what have you, but just questioned him and no arrests were made? You know, I'm always curious or suspect or concerned when you see that kind of militarized force show up at someone's home. We mm -hmm. saw those tanks, mm -hmm. and as you said, his kids standing outside with handcuffs. You always have to question, you know, what role does race, what role does the fact that this is a black man have to do with the way the uh, raid was carried out? Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have you know, talked a whole lot in the last several years in this country about uh, the way that the police departments around this country are, are using military equipment uh, to engage with people who are not engaged in a war. So I didn't like that show of force. It seemed to be heavy-handed. It seemed to be uh, unnecessary, given that they knew he wasn't home. They Obviously, they knew where he was, right, because they confronted him in an airport. Uh, and I don't think there were any real concerns about violence or anyone in the home shooting at the law enforcement agency. So. Uh, that part of it disturbing to me. I'm always concerned as a civil rights lawyer about whether somebody's civil rights were being violated, and particularly the issue of race. We can never ignore that. Uh, but clearly, as I said, there, there had to be something in those probable cause statements presented to the magistrate that caused them to say, hey, there's some evidence in there uh, that is going to perhaps lead to some kind of indictments, some mm -hmm. kind of criminal charges, et cetera. And, and one thing, uh, Stephen, that was particularly important is in the last lawsuit filed by the producer, Mr. Jones, Rodney Jones, yes. he talks about cameras. He says that if you are in uh, Sean Combs' home, he has cameras everywhere, and he's watching everyone that's having sex throughout his home. So. Obviously, uh, my mind tells me one of the things they were probably looking for are those cameras, film footage from those cameras. So uh, I think we can take some cues from some of those lawsuits. Jones alleged, you know, his former employee, obviously, that, 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 alleged, that alleged, has alleged sex trafficking, sexual assault, amongst other things, yeah. uh, under, involving underage girls in the 79-page lawsuit. You just alluded to that. People are looking at P. Diddy right now and folks who are skeptical, who are cynical, who can, dare, dare I say, be cruel, are uh, attaching guilt where there's nothing proven as of yet, are calling him the Jeffrey Epstein of hip hop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you bring up the name Jeffrey Epstein, who committed suicide in 2019, 30 da 35 days after he was arrested right. on sex trafficking charges and what have you, you talked about the show of force that they put out for all of us to see. Do you recall a Jeffrey Epstein situation going down in a similar fashion? I do not. Uh, what I recall about Jeffrey Epstein is lots of folks knew what he was engaged in. And there were efforts to hold him accountable in Florida, uh, even before his, uh, the recent, uh, the more, the last arrest, I should say, where he was incarcerated or in jail, or he's in jail waiting, uh, you know, a trial on those serious charges before he committed suicide. Mm -hmm. I don't remember tanks rolling up to his mansions. Might have happened, not sure, but I don't personally remember it. 
I'm looking at this right now, and again, it's hard to speculate how much trouble he's in, but this is a man that received a Lifetime Achievement Award uh, from, from BET because of, you know, the things that he's accomplished in his career and how he's changed the culture. We knew that he once owned Revolt TV, but I, I mean, she's still own it, but he's obviously going to yeah. have to sell that or what have you. People look at him, and I remember I just interviewed Uncle Luke, Luke Campbell, for mm -hmm. two live crew just this past, uh, past week. And he talked about how Kanye West probably has a worse chance of P. Diddy from recovering from all of this because he attached religion to some of his verbiage and some of the things that he was saying, whereas you look at a guy like P. Diddy, as much as harmful as these allegations may be, you got to prove that he's guilty of such a matter. When you think about what he has to endure, what's coming down the pike, knowing the law the way that you do, knowing law enforcement and how they can really come at you, how much danger do you perceive P. Diddy being in, in terms of his reputation? Is it something he can recover from in your estimation? I think it's going to be very difficult for him to recover. I'm not sure I agree with Luke's assessment about Kanye because it involved religion somehow being easier to recover from. I think in this era, this Me Too era, women in particular are unforgiving unforgiving of these kinds of allegations and particularly if there is any evidence about underage girls I think it's a wrap mm -hmm. we learned from R. Kelly you know when we uh, ignored when we turned a blind eye when we kept dancing to his music and kept you know selling out his concerts only to be made fools of in many ways to see the kinds of, you know, the proof that was presented against him, to see the kind of time that he's serving now. I don't see P. Diddy coming back from this unless there is some proof that all of these allegations are categorically false. Mm. Uh, and that's not typically what you see in these cases, particularly in the civil cases. We see what we saw in Cassie's case, a quiet settlement, a non-disclosure agreement, and it kind of goes away. But the allegations haven't gone away. The lawsuit has gone away. We don't know what they settled for. But he's never been exonerated mm -hmm. from the allegations that Cassie has made. So I, I think this is a different era. I think in this era, those kinds of allegations can be the death nail of your career. Uh, if, you know, if this was an actor, the chances of him acting in another movie, I think, would be slim to none. Yeah. Producers would be afraid to touch him. Other actors don't want to be, you know, in proximity or be on a, a set with him. So, what about the billionaires he's known to fraternize with? What about all well, of those where folks? are they? I haven't seen any of them <laughs> in social media coming out saying, that's my boy, saying right. all this is a lie. So you, you tell me where are they. I'm, <laughs> I'm looking for them, too. Uh, people, these are underage girls. I, uh, even folks who, and I've had some guys, I, I did an interview with a radio host in Chicago, mm -hmm. and he says, oh, Reba, you know, well, these kind of allegations get made, and what's sex trafficking? How do we know it's forced? So even if people are willing to give some kind of pass on the adults in the room, when you get to children, I don't know a person, a single solitary soul that's going to give you a pass mm. on engaging in sexual conduct with children. If P. Diddy asked you to give, my last question to you on this subject, if P. Diddy asked you to give him legal advice on this matter, if you, dare I say, was representing P. Diddy mm -hmm. on this matter, what advice would you give him? Stay quiet, for one. Uh, before the raids, he was on social media, you know, doing some Instagram videos, stay quiet. There's nothing right now that you can say. Let your legal team do its work. Let mm -hmm. them find those witnesses that can substantiate your claim of innocence because you're going to need them, either in a civil case that likely will, one of these cases may end up in trial, and you're going to have to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, if you find yourself indicted, or charged in a criminal case, you're going to have to defend yourself. So let your legal team, hire the best lawyers you can mm -hmm. and let them do their work. Uh, keep your head down and stay low profile and just do what it is you're doing to try to keep your businesses together and your family. Mm -hmm. Most importantly, I'd say to him, your daughters, he has three daughters. So can you imagine your daughters having to wake up and, and see allegations that your father is a sex predator? Mm -hmm. uh, Get your girls in counseling and keep them close. I thought that was going to be my last question, but you did bring up R. Kelly, and I got to ask this. Precedence does matter. And when we see, even though that was a different situation, different case, when we see what ultimately happened with him, he's going to be serving about 30 years in jail. He's, he's in the midst of serving about 30 years in jail. How much, if at all, does that play a role in the likelihood of a mountain of, uh, of legal matters just coming down on him like a tsunami in light of what happened with R. Kelly. 
It plays a big role, I think, in terms of how people are responding. Those billionaires, those buddies of his that used to party with him, I think folks are making sure they keep their distance because of what did happen with R. Kelly. Folks used to come to the defense, or a lot of people came to the defense of R. Kelly, mm -hmm. uh, and only to find themselves on the wrong side of that story, the wrong side of history. See, we've had this evolution in this country around sexual assault. Fifteen years ago, if, you know, representing women, and I've represented a lot of women in sexual harassment, sexual assault claims, the women were shamed. Uh, they were often humiliated. They would often lose their jobs, their reputation, their positions. And the man was always believed. Now, not always, but more often than okay. not, the mm -hmm. man would be, uh, you know, the, the somehow come out the hero. Mm -hmm. And Me Too, we've had a whole paradigm shift. I mean, it's a shift in the way these cases are treated, mm -hmm. the way women are treated. And no longer is it the case that powerful men are given the benefit of the doubt. Uh, we are now willing and ready to hold them accountable. What specifically shifted the paradigm? Is there anything, any incident that stands out in your mind that changed the course of history to the standpoint that we, we, the, you know, what we're living in right now where things have changed so drastically and favorably, I might add, because this needed to happen? Oh, the pendulum needed to swing, right? It was, it was, uh, it was horrible, absolutely positively horrible. Uh, what would happen to women. I, I think social media had a lot to do with it. Women being willing to come forward and tell their story. You know, there's something uh, powerful and there's strength in numbers. So you get one woman telling her story. You know, it's easy to dismiss one person. You get a multiple number of people. You can even dismiss them. But look at Bill Cosby, a case like that. There were tens of dozens of women that came forward and had a story uh, about Bill Cosby drugging them, sexually assaulting them. It's hard to dismiss that many people. And that's kind of what's happening now to P. Diddy. Uh, Cassie Ventura's uh, lawsuit, we thought that was it. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, it just opened the floodgates It for did, others. because she, saw, she filed the lawsuit. The next day it was settled, settled. but it didn't stop other no. allegations from coming down the pipe within a matter of days. And people get emboldened. Now, some people say, and one of uh, Sean's lawyers is a good friend of mine, uh, you know, some folks say it just creates a money grab. Folks who are out there just trying to grab money and, you know, uh, take advantage of this opportunity. I don't discount that. There are false allegations that are made, no doubt about it, but overwhelmingly, women who come forward and make these kinds of allegations, they know what they're going to face. Mm -hmm. They know the challenges going against someone as powerful as P. Diddy or you know, Jeffrey Epstein. So this is no cakewalk. This is not easy. This is not for the faint of heart. So mm -hmm. if you are courageous enough to tell this story, my belief is you're probably telling the truth. Hey, I'm going to give you an opportunity to check me on my own show because one of the things you got on me about was that, you know, what, uh, how I've been so disgusted with the Democratic Party because we're relying on a soon-to-be 82-year-old to for four more years, and I respect your opinion so much. I respect your thoughts so much. It's not the first time I've interviewed you. I'm certainly ho hoping it won't be the last, but I want to give you an opportunity to get at me because of that before I let you get on out of it because I know you do. Go ahead. The floor is yours, Aretha. Okay. What I want to say to you is you yes. have such an incredible platform and following and people respect you and they look up to you. And we need your voice pulling in the direction of saving this democracy. So please save your complaints and all of your gripes about the Democratic Party until after we win this election. It is not a perfect party by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. I have my own complaints, some personal issues I have with the party. And we're going to talk about this at a but later date. I yes, we are. I am mature enough okay. as a voter to recognize that everything we believe in in this country is on the line in this election. And we have too many folks with powerful positions and platforms pulling against us. So those of us who are going to vote for Joe Biden, and you told me yes, you were one of yes, them, I am. then you need to check yourself so that you are not sending conflicting and contradictory messages because somebody will tell me what well, Stephen A. Smith said, he's disgusted with the Democratic Party, so I'm not voting at all. Mm -hmm. So not voting at all is a vote for Donald Trump. I would Trump. never I would never encourage well, people you, not to vote. No, 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 you're I would not, never you're do that. You're not encouraging them right. purposefully right. and intentionally, but when you say you're disgusted with the party, mm -hmm. somebody could interpret that to mean don't vote for the candidate that's at the top of the ticket for the party. 
Queen. Oh, I'm going to have you back here to discuss this at a later <laughs> date. Oh, I'm going to have you back here. I appreciate uh, it, though. Thank you so much. There's so much I want to touch on that, but I appreciate it, Ariva Mark. <laughs> Thank you so much. She is wonderful. She just got on me. I deserved it a little bit, but we're going to talk about this at a later date. Still to come, a pair of squatters have taken over a luxury home, and they won't leave. We're going to dive into the issue of affecting many homeowners across the country. That and so much more next right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show. I want to take a moment to talk to you about something that's caught my attention over the last few weeks. You know what that is? Squatters. A New York City couple is actually being sued by a pair of alleged squatters who moved into a $930,000 Queens duplex investment properly, property, I'm sorry, they rightfully own. It's an ongoing issue in the borough, which in recent weeks has seen multiple homes broken into by invaders who claim rights to the properties. That is because within the five boroughs, squatters need only occupy a property for 30 days before a wide range of legal protections kick in that make it difficult for the owner to evict them. The Queens couple who own the property have now racked up more than $4,000 in legal bills to evict the squatters. You see, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> when you talk about things going awry, when you talk about how we've lost our damn minds, this is that kind of bullshit. So let me get this straight. I go to a bank and I take some money out and I invest in this property. You make me sign away my damn life so I can own this piece of property. And I'm gone. And somehow, some way, some individual or individuals who have no obligations to pay the mortgage or the rent, to pay any of the light bills, to pay anything, end up slithering their way into my property. And because I might have been gone for 30 days and they used those 30 days to occupy a property I own, I have to go through legal means to remove them and even then I might be unsuccessful because squatter laws gives somebody the right to have my property, to live in my property, to refuse to leave my property. And you wonder why people are looking at this country and wondering what the hell is wrong with us. Does that make any sense to y'all? Any sense whatsoever? You work your ass off, you've been working all of these months, and you decide to take a month-long cruise or go on vacation and come back and because you've been gone and somebody slithered their way into your private property and they take hold of your property, you can't remove them. You are the one that has to deal with the law. They get to sit up there and just lavish in your abode, in your habitat. This is the problem when people talk about this country has lost its damn mind. I don't know what's going to come of this. I'm not advocating violence of any kind. I'm not a violent individual. I just want to ask all of y'all out there. Remember Cedric the Entertainer when he was talking about the Wish Creed when he was doing Kings of Comedy? He said, you know, folks hope and they hope, they hope things go well, they hope things will work out. He said, I don't come from that creed. We come from the wish creed. We wish. We wish somebody would. He was talking about concert seats. Imagine what the average person, white, black, Latino, and beyond, would feel about somebody occupying their home. You know what that's going to end up, you know what's going to end up happening, right? Violence is next, because I'll be damned if I'm going to sit idly by and watch somebody take over my property. You shitting me? I know I'm speaking for millions of people. I'm speaking for any homeowner. I don't know of one who literally would sit up there and tolerate that. Seriously. 
Let's move on to some tweets before I take your calls to end up the show, to end the show for today. Right here at Stephen A. Smith Show, fresh off vacation, by the way. Let's go to some tweets right now, okay? At Liam Bear 15 writes, hey, Stephen A., what is your favorite Pop-Tart flavor? Mine is brown sugar cinnamon. I like cherry. That's just me. I like cherry. Cherry is what works for me. Cherry works for me, okay? I like the cherry flavor, all right? Strawberry, that works for me, too. Those are really the only two. Pop-Tarts, I'm really not down for any other kind of flavor. That's just my style. Let's get to the next tweet, please. Let me see what else you got up here, all right? At Dub's World, that's in WRLD30, right? Stephen A., what are your favorite fast food places to eat of all time? You know, people talk about McDonald's and Burger King and all that other stuff. That's true because I, you know, I've eaten both. I like my double cheeseburgers from from uh, Burger King. I like my Big Macs or the cheeseburgers from McDonald's. McDonald's fries are a hell of a lot better than Burger King's fries. But my favorite, I can't help it, y'all, is White Castle. I love White Castle. Single cheeseburgers, double cheeseburgers, whatever. Their fries are pretty damn good itself. Now, I will admit, I will admit, it's the greatest laxative I've ever tasted. Because when you eat some White Castle, your ass going to go to the bathroom now. Make no mistake about it. You're going to go to the bathroom. You're going to go to the bathroom. And, and, and you're going to let, let's just say, some air out prior to that makes it clear you need to go to the bathroom. You understand what I'm saying? You're going to pass gas. So you want to make sure you ain't got to go out on a date. You're going to make sure you don't have to have no business meetings. You're going to make sure you don't have to be around bosses or colleagues or anything like that. Because you eat some White Castle. One way or another, through the smell, they going to know. Because... It's got a laxative kind of effect on me personally. I can't speak for everybody, but I'll tell you about me. But boy, is it delicious. It's worth it. I got to admit it. It's worth it. White Castle, it is, it's that. No doubt about that. I'm sorry. That's just how I feel about it. Let's get to another tweet, please, right here. At Legion Hoops, right, Stephen A. Number one NBA draft picks of the last five years. Rank them one to five. Zion Williamson, all right? Pablo Banquero, Victor Wembignana, Gabe Cunningham, and of course the Ant-Man himself, Anthony Edwards. Well, first of all, let me start at number five. I'm going to put Gabe Cunningham in number five. He can play, uh, but he ain't one of those four. And number two, you know, they're the Detroit Pistons. This year, we, we, all, we all see what we have seen. That's number one. So we're going to have to do that, okay? I'm going to have to put Ben Kiro at number four, but I reserve the right to alter, because the list is fluid. The list is fluid, okay? I reserve the right to change my mind because Ben Kiro is coming. Orlando Magic are a top five seed in the Eastern Conference. The brother can play. I got mad respect for him. I, we, we might change this, but at the moment, I got to put him... At number five, I'm mean, number four, I'm sorry. Um, Victor Wembignana is a rookie. He's seven feet five. San Antonio ain't been winning games. So I know it's apropos to put him at number three, but I'm not going to. You know what I'm going to put at number three? I'm going to put Zion Williamson at number three. The man child that he is has missed too many games. Now, if I'm going by what we've seen over the last month to six weeks of Zion Williamson, he'd be number one. But since that is an aberration, that is something that has come on as of late, I have to see if that is going to continue. And until that time, I have to look at Zion Williamson and I got to put him at number three. I got to put him at number three. Okay? I'm going to put Anthony Edwards at number two. The brother's a Skywalker. There's no doubt about it. I love him. I'm a huge fan of his. Okay? But I need him to work even more on his perimeter shooting. I think that's the one thing that could elevate him. I have to put Victor Wembignana at number one because he's doing what he's doing as a rookie, and he's seven feet five. 
So he's going to block shots. He's going to rebound. He's going to alter shots. He's going to elevate you defensively. And the brother's got a jump shot. He's got a handle. He could finish at the basket because he's so tall and he's real thin skinny. He's only going to get heavier. I have to look at Victor Wembanyama. The only reason I would pick him over Anthony Edwards is because you can't teach seven feet five. But that's the only reason. That's the only reason. One more tweet to go right here. And it says, at Bucks Show, yo. Which, is this Jay Hodo? Is that what it is? Or Hodo, the Jay Silent? Or Jodo, the H is silent. Okay. Which Jodo starter are you choosing, Stephen A? Chico Rita, Cinderquill, Toto Dial. To to well, how do you pronounce that? Toto Dial? What the hell? What the hell is these names? I don't know the names of this, but I'm going to tell you this. Cinderquill is where I'm going to go. Look like fire coming out of the backside. That means you're going to back up and stay the hell away from that thing. That's White Castle right there. That's White Castle. That's what I'm talking about. You see, that's somebody that ate some White Castle. So I'm going to go with that. But again, it's not a knock. I don't want anybody to think that it's a knock. All of us want to go to the toilet. All of us, it's very, it's very relieving, okay, to go to the toilet and let it all out. I'm not saying that negatively about White Castle. It's very helpful in that regard to me. And it's delicious. It's delicious. White Castle's the joint. I mean, I've been getting myself in better shape, so I don't eat that much of White Castle anymore. But God, I love it, and I miss it so much. Just thinking about it makes me want to cry. Anyway, let me get on out of here for the day. Before I get on out of here, let me take some of your calls, all right? Calling us at 888-727-5303. That's 888-SAS-5303. Let's get to the calls before I get on out of here. Johnny in Gainesville, Florida. You're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. Yo, Stephen A., what are you thinking about our Yankees sweeping the Astros? It's nice, but it's early in the season. It's nice, but it's early in the season. Um, it's nice to see them doing what they're doing. I'm relying on Soto and Judge and, and LeMahieu and these brothers. Let's see what they do. But ultimately, the Yankees have disappointed me on too many occasions over the last several years, and I need them um, to, 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 to really shore things up. Garrett Cole is out at the beginning of the season. We'll see what he does. I'm not sure about their pitching staff as the season progresses, but they've been losing religiously in Houston. So to see them go on a road for a four-game series and to sweep the Houston Astros, I love that. I'm very, very happy about that. I can't say enough. They can't start the season any better. I'll tell you that much. Appreciate the call, man. Let's go to Cornelius in Kalamazoo, Michigan. You're live with Stephen A. What's up? What's up, uh, uh, Cornelius? What's going on? Hey, what's up, Stephen A? So uh, this question is under the assumption that Dak is done after this season with the Cowboys. What do you think about Shadur Sanders to the Cowboys? I love his game. I just think he's too small. I think he's got to get bigger. I really do. Um, I think to play the quarterback position, particularly on the NFL level, I think he's going to have to get bigger. I saw a lot of punishment he absorbed last year. Um, it was, he got gimpy as the season uh, waned. Uh, got to a point where primetime felt he had to protect this young man, his son, at the quarterback spot because he didn't have the level of protection that was needed. And so uh, I don't have any questions about his skill. I don't have any uh, questions about his moxie, um, his courage under fire, per se. Uh, no pun intended for the movie, uh, led by De with Denzel Washington. Um, but, but the bottom line is, is that you got to get more size playing that quarterback position on the National Football League level. Those are men that's going to be laying some wood on you. You can't be his size and survive but so long playing that position. I don't believe it. Thanks for the call. Anthony, last caller in New York. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Anthony? How are you going? How's it going, Stephen A.? I'm all right. Yourself? Good, good. So I'm in New York City going to the Mets game. What's your favorite restaurant in the city? My favorite restaurant in the city? I got a couple of spots. Um, uh, I think they renamed it, but one of them was Mercer's Kitchen uh, down in Tribeca. Uh, Wolfgang Pucks over there in the Tribeca area. I like that a lot. Red Eye Grill in New York City on 56th and 7th. I like that spot. Um, you know, there's uh, the Porter Steakhouse inside the Tom Warner Center. That's a nice spot as well. Uh, along with a, a, a club that's right next door to it. It's pretty fly as well. Asiata, uh, Asiata rather, inside the Mandarin Oriental. That's a nice one. It's a few of them. I just gave you a few, so you should not have any problems finding one of them. All of them are can't miss.
All right. I got to get on out of here for the day. I hope y'all enjoyed the show. My first game back from vacation. I really enjoyed it. Looking forward to being back with you in the next couple of days. And thanks once again to eclipsing our followers and the subscribers to over 602,000. We continue to climb exponentially day after day after day. Could not have happened without your love and support. I appreciate it. Keep it coming and I'm going to keep on coming. Until next time, everybody, this is Stephen A. signing off. Peace and love.